20th December 2017 My grandmother said Usitwaibishe Those words have basically molded me into the lady I am today My name is Nikita Kering I'm a 17 year old Kalenjin performing artist and uh, if there are any Kalenjins in this uh, audience, you probably have those words Usitwa Ibishe carved out at the back of your throats. Or if I were to stop this speech right now, being a 17-year-old singer, <laughs> you probably know where this speech is going. Now, as a performing artist, there's so many expectations of me. My friends, who I'm to be cool around, <laughs> My parents, who I'm to be cool around, but also not too cool, or else they'll think I'm becoming a rebel. My extended family, who need me to be calm, collected, respectful, ladylike. And all me, <laughs> well, I want to be whatever I want to be, whenever I want to be. And like whoever I saw on TV was basically my type. But then I remember the words, Usitwai <laughs> Bishe. And all my dreams of becoming like my musical idols all just crumbled down like a house of cards. Because those were the exact epitome of who grandma, of who dad, of who mom, of who uncle didn't want me to be. Because as grandma was still getting used to women wearing trousers and my mom was still getting used to the trousers that I was wearing, I basically looked up to Beyonce who performed in a swimsuit. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I lived in an environment where you're not supposed to sing about love. You're not supposed to sing about heartbreak, not supposed to sing about how I feel about women empowerment or else you threaten the man. But then I walk around asking myself, why can't I be me? Simple old me, and not a duplicate of my all-holy forefathers. Not having to, to walk around in, in a facade while everybody else who raised me enjoys the freedom of being themselves. I am Nikita's mother. <laughs> <laughs> and also a mother of four other amazing children, so really a mother of five. Twelve years ago, I was shopping with Nikita. She was barely, she was five years old. And we were in a clothes store. And there's this lady that just stopped, you know, as we were shopping. She was also shopping. And looked at me and looked at my little girl. And then there was some awkwardness, obviously, because I didn't know why she was staring at us. She had just heard Nikita sing, you know. She sings to herself a lot. Her classmates know that. And she told me, this girl is talented. That's a beautiful voice. Remember, this is a five-year-old girl. Now, you don't tell a dreamer like myself. No, you don't break such news to a dreamer like me. Because, you know, the world came down. Heavens came down. I mean, you just said my daughter is talented. I mean, the only talent I knew about was people on TV. And... You know, I saw Whitney in my house. <laughs> or should I say Yvonne Chaka Chaka, those of my generation. <laughs> and wow, I fastened my seatbelts, ready for takeoff to Hollywood. You know, for the Grammys, I'm sure you know that. And so from that day on, you know, from that shopping incident, that's what I choose to call it, we took a more keen interest in what she was doing. So um, we ensured that any family event, this girl had to sing. <laughs> Church, school, events. I mean, fortunately, the teachers also saw what you know, the stranger had seen. So they gave her all the parts to sing. And she was really enjoying herself. And we were really proud. And within no time, TV stations started calling in, media houses, you know, um, interviews. 
My little girl was now a child celebrity. Of course, she was getting better with age. We also got busier because nothing really prepared us for a child in the limelight. We really didn't know what it meant until it happened. You see, there's no handbook. There's no induction on how to parent such a child. And she's growing, you know, and as, as a young girl, it's easy to manage her, it's easy to control, it's easy, it, it, it's easy to determine who she will sing to and who she will not, you know, and what she should sing. But as she grows, I think start changing. She wants her freedom. She wants to dress in, you know, whatever. <laughs> I can tell you, this is the other job that no one prepares you for. And you know, sometimes after, you know, we've had events from very early in the morning to very late at night, and I'm feeling exhausted. I ask myself, where does this energy come from? Probably it would have been easier if I grew up in the US, you know, where there is exposure, there is talent, there's a lot you can learn from people. Or maybe Nairobi, uh, see, where there was television when I was growing up and movies. But I didn't grow up in any of those places. I was raised in a village. A village in Meru, where they grow Mira, I'm sure you know about that. <laughs> Actually, a real village. Born as a firstborn of an African conservative dad. And my mom, Ryle, a high school teacher in the village. Now, she was not only a high school teacher, she was born again. And so when you happen to be the firstborn of a high school teacher who is also born again, come preacher, then it is terror. The expectations are very high, or were very high. I was supposed to be a clone of my own mother. The rules, the to-do lists, greet people with respect, always smile, always be neat. Now, but the not-to-do list was even longer. You know, I remember her saying, you know, you can't just go and play outside with anybody. Remember, you are the daughter of a teacher. So you can't leave the gate. So I was living in a gated community because I couldn't leave the gate. <laughs> My mother occasionally wonders about looking at boys, not talking with them, looking at them. It was a sin. Talking to them was reasonable. <laughs> Her standards were very, very high. Teacher, Christian, you know, you must follow the Bible. Don't allow the devil to come in between, you know, and mess you. What will everybody say? And I'm sure some of us have been raised in that kind of environment. Somehow we'll always find a way to get our freedom. And I did that once in a while. I remember this day. There's this boy who had um, a wooden tricycle. You know, there were no bicycles when I was growing up in the 70s. So a wooden tricycle. He had made it. And it, it really looked like something very nice to you know, ride in. And I, I thought to myself, if they would allow me to ride, oh, I mean, th this is an amazing opportunity. And they did. Who will not allow the daughter of a teacher to ride in their motorbike? Who? <laughs> and so, the only condition was you carry it uphill, because really it's supposed to roll downhill. And that was a very small thing for me, so I carried it. And we went up the hill. And I'm telling you, there were three of us on it. Oh, the thrill. We were rolling down. You know, the only thing I could compare that to is a miracle, because if you've seen them, they literally fly. <laughs> and we were rolling, and we were excited. Uh, probably I was the most excited. It was my first time I was riding in, in such. Remember, it's gravity. There is no accelerator. There is no brake on this thing. So, because we were at high speed and we have lost direction, we naturally landed where? In the river. Now, I was shocked. I was wet. I was muddy. And I had a very serious pain on my left hand. Wow, I was going to face my mother. And so I took the walk of shame home. One thing I told myself is that I would not tell my mother. It doesn't matter what the pain I was feeling. I was not going to face that woman. I was not. 
So I got home and I stayed with my pain. And for three days, I stayed in pain. But on the fourth day, it was unbearable. So I decided to face her and tell her what had happened. Ladies and gentlemen, you should have seen her face. The only thing I remember is that she, with her hands, she picked on my chubby cheeks. They were quite chubby. She pulled them up. She redirected my head to the hospital. <laughs> and we walked. And she called me names as we walked. Remember, she's a born again Christian. <laughs> and there's nothing I didn't hear. I was ashamed. I was pained. Not the pain on my arm, but deep inside. You know, I told myself, look, this is very difficult. I'll never, never, never want to be like my mother. She's not my role model. In fact, I'll not be a teacher like her. I'll read hard, I'll study hard and leave the village. Go far away, work in Nairobi. That was a place to work. Marry very far away from home so that we don't get to meet and live happily ever after. With time, I realized that uh, something, something just came up that I could use my time in a different way and ignore the world outside. I discovered I had a talent, actually, which nobody had noticed. I could plait hair. I don't know how many people know how to plait hair. So I would plait hair as a very young girl. Imagine, nine years old, I could plait hair. And I started with my sister, started with my cousins, you know, those people who were allowed to come into our house. And my mother realized that it's something that really looked good. I graduated from a hairdresser to a beautician. How? I started piercing ears with thorns, you know? <laughs> I started with my own, and I was successful. And then to my sister, and then, you know, my cousins, and anybody who was courageous enough to face the thorn. <laughs> and uh, suddenly I was doing something that, you know, people appreciated. Actually, my parents appreciated. I want to say that I proceeded with uh, my hairdressing habits or talent until the university. I actually even had a salon at the university with my friend. And uh, it was amazing that, you know, you could make people look beautiful when they appreciated that. My mother encouraged it, but always reminded me that, you know, hairdressing is not for people who are at the university, but just do it for the time being. So when I graduated in 1994 from Moy University, that was the last day I made hair, because we couldn't have a graduate hairdresser in our home, really, the daughter of a teacher, no. So I had to go either be a banker or just work in some office somewhere. So I actually lost my passion, a part of me went with that. But the one thing I remember telling myself is that when I grow up and I have my children, I'll allow them to do whatever pleases them, whatever uh, they are passionate about. Well, I kept my promise of going to work in Nairobi. Actually, I made sure I did not become a teacher. And then I came to work in Nairobi. And uh, besides that, I got married very far away <laughs> in Eldred to Joe, my husband, of many years. And um, what is very, very surprising is that as we raised our children, I faced the same challenges that my mother faced raising us. I realized that I started setting the same standards, high standards, and expecting nothing less. Same way mom had done it. I realized that actually I have become my mother. How could I become somebody that I never wanted to become? You know, when it came to discipline, there is no compromise. If you're going to class, you must excel. If you're going to sing, you must do it. Excel, the Grammys must come home. <laughs> So, I mean, the enigma of life. Some things you run away from, you know, like follow you up with speed. And so when my daughters and my children actually say, you're putting so much pressure 
What does that take me back to? My mother, Ryan. But the other thing I realized is that that pressure that she put me on, that place, that, that uh, fast pace she put me on, is probably the reason that I can juggle so many things. My friends think that I'm crazy. I can do so many things that I go and not get mad. Because really, I think I was so accustomed to so much pressure. And so, even when we are doing recording and I have to sit through the day and I still have work to do and I have children to feed and my husband to take care of, I mean, I realize it's probably because I was raised by a giantess that is my mother. And I'm so proud of her. But yet, do I want to put pressure on Nikita to be me? Or any of my children to be me? I know it's for mothers here and for parents here. There's a very thin line. And you're caught between you know, having your children do what you want and the fact that they need to express themselves in many ways. Because I believe there's a reason God gifted them. God gave you to them because he has different giftings for them and you should allow them to express themselves in that. But it's not easy. However, I would like my children to always know, I would like Nikita to always know that mama's interest is that they, f they follow their dreams, they excel, that they follow the beautiful values, beautiful African values that we have. <laughs> However, they should at no time be tempted to be a version of mama because God created them differently. And so yes, I was raised by a, a village girl. <laughs> One whose story might as well be a facsimile of mine. See, a village girl who wanted to be the opposite of what her mother wanted. A village girl who <laughs> wanted to be a hairdresser, but she knew that all that would cost are just twists and knots and all that was left in the relationship with her mother. A village girl who sought love as far west as she could get. And so I asked myself, and should I be the shy and timid girl who was too scared to tell her parents of what she actually did? Or should I be as free as the one who found love in what was thought to be a hopeless place. And now coiled deep inside of me is the need to know that if mother knew all things would blow and I, and I still packed my things and left in the low, would I then be equipped with the tools and freedom to be me? Or would I bury my own grave seeking freedom far too much to sow? Thank you. Thank you.